I, I was trying to think throughout this, how do we bring all these uh, different bits together to then start to have a discussion. And I suppose what's interesting, and we'll go, we can go through different themes, but what was really interesting is talking about what is happening right now in the Middle East or in, the, um, in, that, in that context. And then what, what we heard from Yara was within that region, a very conflicted kind of um, area and how then architecture plays a role within that. Um, and so both of those seem to have a very globalized, in a way, influence, uh, be it political or be it financial. Um, what we saw from uh, what you showed, Akram, it was it was this kind of global finance um, having huge influence to keep this global market going. It's much more what religion was, <laughs> the the financial system is for for architecture. And what uh, Yara was talking about was how again the 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 form of this political struggle also starts to have a form, be it a very neutral one that, um, that you can kind of, I don't know, project anything onto. And what you guys were talking about is that what AA actually offers is not necessarily for you to go out there and do those buildings uh, necessarily, but to critically think where you position yourselves within this kind of politically complex, um, politically and economically complex world. Um, one thing I would say as an ex-AA, uh, as an AA alumni, um, is that I do think the AA needs to take that quite seriously and build actually systems where students can design organizations and practices that they can go out and do that because not everybody can do that straight off. So the, 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 the default position is that you go into a practice and that's not what you've been trained to do. So there is a schism. Um, and so that I just wanted to, but now questions, sorry. I just wanted to kind of bring that maybe together. Um, so I think there was, um, I'd, like to t I'd like to put out there a question actually to maybe everyone around this notion of how, whether, you know, that as a discussion, this idea of how architecture makes concrete these kind of economic or political forces. And I'll go back to the issue of agency and what agency does the architect have within this concretization of financial wealth that we saw in what you were talking about and um, colonial practices that Yara was talking about. And then we can come back from a student's perspective. So I just wondered whether we could talk about that notion of how can the architect critique that in a way? I think architects are not getting involved enough <clears throat> in the uh, development of new materials. And uh, I'm not for architects to be involved too much in that, in the sense whereby, you know, certain universities like McGill would say, you can't get into the university unless you have a chemistry subject. Hmm. It's not that. But, but getting involved in a sort of more, more of the, the nanotechnology part, because there are carbon materials out there that are extremely light and much more powerful than steel, and eventually, and they're superconductors, but eventually they will be very cheap. And, and that uh, will be, uh, what is ironic is that actually the, what is causing harm to the environment is carbon, yet these carbon materials are the ones that will save the environment mm -hmm. eventually. Yeah. So carbon, <laughs> what we are made of basically is that is the is the solution as well as being the problem. But uh, but uh, but I think is that uh, uh, architects not getting involved enough in in in, in the development of these materials. In fact, many architects or most architects don't know much about them. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, there are materials so light. Actually, they're actually in, even transparent mm. materials that are very light and they're much stronger than steel. Mm. 
when you when I, I, I showed some of the you know mega projects, the the the, the carbon uh, emissions alone from the cement industry. Mm. Uh, I can't remember the figure, but it's something horrendous. It's like some sixty percent of emissions in the, in the world come from cement industry. Mm. So all that cement has been poured into these mega projects. That's one thing. And and one thing you should remember is that whatever you see overground, there is much bigger stuff underground. Yeah. You know, and these like uh, dynamic forms that we do here and there, and uh, mm. uh, and and then the foundations for it to fly out. The foundation for that has to be just as it's like the roots of the tree, mm. you know. Mm. So basically, there's so much underneath, and it's all it's mostly cement and steel. Mm. Uh, but, so yeah, yeah sorry. But, but no, no. But I I wonder also. I mean, if we're talking about materials, if we're also talking about materials, there is something in terms of the extractive practices, not just of the materials off the ground, but also social colonial extractive practices that are happening, labor practices which are horrific for around some of these uh, buildings um, and human rights around, you know, people having their passports taken away, you know, um, in order to build for almost, it's almost like modern day slavery in, in a lot of ways. So, so then I suppose in that sense, um, you know, we have colonialism again in a very different way, not so much, it might not be the, the forms uh, in a way, but actually in the production process. And maybe, Yara, can I bring you in in both of those? But it was a great angle to get in it. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting point, especially given the current uh, situation. I mean, what kind of, what, uh, what an irony uh, discussing the line project uh, nicely critiqued uh, uh, claiming that it is uh, a zero carbon and it's environmentally friendly by the developers and uh, discussing climate and uh, ecology at a time that there is also destruction that is taking place especially in the Middle East but as you rightly mentioned this kind of like whole notion of actually uh, extractive practices where material, where the materials become a sim it, they are actually a symbol of uh, colonial power because it always happens to subjugate the weak. It always tends to happen to scar the landscape of the weak on the expense of the weak. So if we are to discuss ecology and if we are to discuss the current kind of uh, spatial uh, climate, we also need to discuss the social ecology and how mm. that's impacting societies and how that's leaving a lot of communities uh, it, it kind of trying to survive on the expense of the powerful. Uh, and I just want to mention Gaza here as an example. Uh, at the time that the uh, West or the Global North is discussing climate and ecology and being sensitive, only within the first couple of weeks of destroying Gaza, the extent of carbon emission that has been produced was in two weeks was equivalent to the carbon emission produced in the UK in a whole year. Yet, this is not a subject that is being discussed. So it's kind of like the destruction itself and the extraction and the scars that are being produced are equally as dangerous as the monuments that are being erected. And I think it's an aspect aspect that we as architects have to have a position, a, not only AA, not only universities, but also RIBA and ARB and all of those institutions who are the bigger umbrella under which we are um, practicing. Thank you so much. Um, maybe I pick up then from when you mentioned the word monument, uh, Yara, because also, Akram, what you were showing to me were quite monuments to wealth, actually. Um, and, uh, and Yara, you were talking about monuments and de de kind of almost like um, deconstructing the monuments through your installation. Um, and I wonder whether there's a really interesting conversation here about the role of monuments and all the discussions that's been had also around Black Lives Matter and what should happen to the monuments, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, so maybe if I pass over 
to you in terms of, um, you know, can we discuss this notion of the monument being erected and, and maybe deconstructed? Any of you? <laughs> As you also rightly mentioned earlier, there is a lot kind of like this association of the monument with the masculinity and power has always been a problematic issue, but more importantly, the monument and ethics. And I think that's an aspect that we generally tend to uh, ignore and undermine. And sadly, I mean, there isn't much for me to... Probably it's more of a comment that it is sad that we are still living in a context where the monument is very uh, cherished and glorified against social practices, against mm. community, against the informal, against mm. the everyday. There is still the obsession of the architect to celebrate uh, by creating architectural monument, which often tends uh, to have an ethic. I mean, there is always an ethical question that needs to be asked, whose monument, who is it built for, and why? Mm. And how much can we appreciate also the non-monument? Yeah. Uh, and the little details as an act of, uh, as, as a, a practice, when will the um, mainstream uh, media, when will the mainstream journalism and marketing materials also start to talk about architecture by breaking away or uh, walking away from only uh, monuments and being obsessed by the tallest, the biggest, the fattest, I don't know, you name it, I mean, the <laughs> London, Paris, and Abu Dhabi, all looking the same, we're all resulting in this kind of faceless landscape that is looking the same. If we are to discuss richness and identity, we need to look down to what the community are doing, and I don't think this is a cliche. If anything, this is exactly the time that we need to re think that, and architectural institutions also need to promote that, which also means that we need to rethink aesthetics and we need to rethink what do we mean by uh, values and aesthetics within the global north that we teach our students about all the time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Akram, um, just segue into you. you. You talked about heroic. <laughs> uh, so maybe it would be interesting on that. What, what could we in the future talk about, her you know, what could be a heroic yeah, architecture. I, yeah, I, I think um, I think uh, talking about monuments yeah. because you've got your physical monument, uh, then you've got your event. Mm. The event can be the monument, yeah. and and events are energy, you know. So in the end, it's matter and energy. <laughs> so energy is much more powerful than matter. So uh, an event can be a demonstration in the street, or it can be a concert. Mm or an outrageous party, I mean, that mm. event. So, so monuments can be uh, events mm. and can be remembered also mm. As, mm. as events, but, they, but they, can, they don't have to be physically uh, represented. They can be in, in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. Uh, so in that respect, it's interesting to draw these sort of parallels between mm. what is physical and what is energy, mm. yeah. what is matter and what is energy. Yeah. Thank you so much. I want to bring you two in. Um, just, you're going to be graduating. So where, where would you think you might want to be positioned? <laughs> do you want to be building heroic buildings or do you have heroic events? Or do you have a, like from what you've interviewed, is there something that you would like to position yourselves in? Yeah. Um, the question is really relevant because I've been asking that, <laughs> and I think I've. I one of the people even said it's okay to be lost. Mm -hmm. um, but I understood a education, and from most of the interviews, um, it's some people seeing architecture as giving more attention to the material or to the structure, and some to the space, and questioning the space. Who is it for? or questioning the monument, um, who gets to make it, who gets to use it. Um, and I think there everyone finds the architect's role and then they go and make their own careers. Um, to me, I think I'm more into the space and the idea of, for instance, Reem um, Sharif 
and a young alumni is now working with um, refugee um, young um, young people in refugee camps, and I think she's doing an incredible job of just gathering the kids together mm. to build, mm. um, and that itself creates agency mm. and um, decolonizes the um, the mindset through the space. Mm. Um, and I think that's valuable and that's the power architects can have mm. um, if, if they choose to, like, if, if they like it, if they want to use it. And there are other, others that can do so through the material uh, explorations that are relevant to the, um, to the landscape. And I think it's just asking the good questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Do you want to, do you have more to add? <laughs> <laughs> I should cover it all, but for me, when I actually have these interviews, what was really interesting for me is that everybody seems to have a story, a line, just didn't know how to connect them. And when they just told everything, they see that somehow they connected, but mm, just a matter of how they are going to connect them. Mm. Uh, and this is kind of positioning. Mm. It's not going to be the answer of, am I going to be architect or not? Mm. But for me, is that you find your way that you are instantly changing, but in your own life. So much. I think it's good to um, open it up to the audience a bit before I close uh, a closing comment. Any questions? I just wanted to compare um, the rise of all these monuments that Akram you sort of showed, um, and also the colonization of Palestine, if, if you like. Um, what, um, and, and compare it in just a little bit to what happened in Iran, where uh, modernity you know, was supplanted uh, seemingly by a very traditional, old fashioned, back looking, uh, if you like, revolution, if that, that's, how, that's how some people described it. But in other quarters, it was actually the toppling of that kind of Eurocentric modernity which ha had the form of a medieval religion, yeah, which was described as something modern, right? In a sense, that initiated a kind of a new modernity, which was based on, on dialogue, not, not with the authorities necessarily, but, but it kind of released participation of, of certain people, for example, from traditional backgrounds in Iran who couldn't take part, didn't want to take part necessarily in education and anything else before that. Uh, and I'm wondering if um, in, in, in those countries, the rise and rise of these monuments, right? Uh, how, how does it not affect the population that are there in terms of their ethics, their morals, what they want from their that. lives, so to speak? How, does it have no effect whatsoever? I mean, the impression one gets, are they just being bribed, you know, with, with money to just accept, accept that? And if so, what is the role of architecture? in that, in actually provoking that type of protest. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's interesting what you're saying. You see, I, I was involved in renovating a monument. Uh, and it was, a, it was called the Martyrs Monument. And it was like commemorating the soldiers from the Jordan Army who, not just from the Jordan Army, but you know, the, from the region, who fought uh, in 1948. And okay, that that was a monument commemorating. Uh, that. So so that that is uh, at a level whereby of, of remembrance basically. Then then you come to uh, certain areas in in our region as well in the Middle East, where the monument is the person. Is not uh, it's not a building and it's not an event. You know, so you mo monumentalize a person, and then uh, that becomes uh, very dangerous uh, uh, because you know th that's always connected to a political system that is somehow uh, very authoritarian. So that's one aspect of monumentality, um, and then you have the the other thing is that. Um, 
when you I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, so, so uh, something came to me. And went. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it will come to me later. I'll, I'll come back to you. Oh yes. Sorry. The ideology. You see. You see. Colonialism. And we talked about colonialism. Uh, and uh, and and uh, there are of course different types of colonialism. Uh, some are more, much more malicious than others, and uh, if it's uh, if it's like like in Iran, it was an ideology in the form of uh, religion. You know, that that is quite dangerous. And in other areas where the ideology is, uh, and that's of course what's happening in the Middle East at the moment. You know, there are sort of like colonial settler settler uh, communities that are that their ideology is embedded in their religion. And uh, so that becomes very dangerous, and that is monumental. The ideology becomes monumental. So, uh, yeah, that's basically what... Uh... Um, I suppose just from um, all the presentations, um, what was very interesting is that the idea of colonialism was actually enabled by technology of, of its time, whatever that was, and it was for financial growth. You know, that was its its major, you know, whether it was slavery or <laughs> oil or resources or whatever it is, and now there are companies who are going to the moon to extract minerals. Um, so this transition from Eurocentricism, how does it look like in a way that, because I'm gonna leave you with a question, in a post-Fordist industrial system that gave us modernism as an architectural style, and now we're in a post-Fordist and more information society, which is global and global finance and technology, as we've just seen, has gone even more crazy. Um, so then what are the spaces that we need to, in a way, occupy, whether they are in the physical or the, the virtual? Because that's where it's happening, actually. The, the information society post-Fordism is all in, in this other technological, the fourth revolution, the fourth, fourth industrial revolution. So, so what is our role as architects in a way to move post that? And I, think none, I don't think that many of us are thinking about that, at least from what I see in crits outside this, not here, but everywhere <laughs> that I go. Um, and so I suppose as educationists, um, that's what... I would kind of put out there for all of us to think about as well. And I'd just like to really thank our speakers. Thank you too. Thank you for your interviews. Thank you, Yara. Thank you, Akram. That was a wonderful set of presentations. And uh, that's it. <laughs>